Welcome to Berlin. Thanks so much for coming this uh, early afternoon here for our first session of the Park City University seminar series for doing some entrepreneurs about the EU route to market strategies. Let me first start with uh, introducing our panel here, which is very distinguished. First, we've got on the, on the left side over there, it's Mark de Witt, uh, the CEO of uh, Royal Dutch uh, De Kuyper, who's going to speak about the Netherlands as a perfect European test and entry market. Uh, then we've got Roland Gillespie here, the closest one to me, uh, who is with Next Step International and before with, I think, Pernod Ricard and uh, Kerry Gold and some others. He's going to talk about that. He's going to talk about the road to market options in the EU. And actually, he's going to come right after me, uh, after I give the initial uh, introduction. And then Billy Erickson in the middle uh, from Tequila Fortaleza. He is uh, providing uh, an example for a market strategy uh, for his uh, tequila brand, or his and his father's tequila brand, Fortaleza. My name is Harry Coleman. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Park Street. I want to just give a little bit of a background uh, for the round to market strategy. So I'm going to talk about the foundations. I'm um, just going to quickly highlight the overall market. And for those of you who know the US market, I'm going to contrast a little bit the, Europe, uh, the European market with the US market. Uh, and talk about a, a couple of compliance considerations before I'm going to hand it over to Ronan to talk about the strategies. So you look at the uh, European market, uh, it's uh, 512 million people, uh, it's a very large market. Uh, we have the UK still in here and uh, uh, by uh, April next year this market might be a little slower, uh, might be a little smaller, but um, from my discussions of the last two days, it's apparently not a given, and there's still some hopes by a bunch of Europeans uh, that the UK might not leave after all. Uh, talking about the alcohol regulation in the European Union, uh, basic objectives of alcoholic beverage regulation generally is fourfold. One is fiscal, one is economic development, one is public order and safety, and one is public health. Um, from a fiscal perspective, the EU itself as a body has never been involved in collecting taxes. So there is nothing of an equivalent of the federal excise tax in the United States. Um, there, is, there are attempts of the European Union to try to harmonize excise taxes that are being collected by the states, but that is basically the only thing they've been doing. Uh, questionable the success because they're still very widely across the different states in the European Union. From, a, um, from an economic development perspective, the EU has been active uh, when they try to, mostly on the wine side, try to help growers to possibly limit other growth areas, etc., in order to make sure that the supply and demand is in balance, but nothing really on the spirit side. On, uh, when the European Economic Council was uh, founded, which was a predecessor of the European Union, there was really no direct role given with regards to the public order and safety principle of regulation. So there was nothing where they might have gone in and said like, hey, we want to have a unified rule with regards to responsible consumption, etc. And uh, the, uh, the last thing here is the, the member states have been unable to implement practice in the rules treating domestic and imported products alike on their domestic market. So therefore, the EU has basically tried to just use the court of justices to try to get uh, to a more common market. Meaning, if somebody feels like that they were locked out of a particular market, the EU took that country or that regulation to court in order to alleviate the situation. So, uh, for those of you who know the US market very well, there's a three-tier system in the US with distinct uh, system, uh, the distinct tiers of the manufacturing tier, the wholesaler tier, and the retail tier, uh, before going to the consumer. While on the EU side, there is a loosely harmonized country-specific system, meaning uh, suppliers, importers, or multiple role players can sell to everybody, to wholesalers, retailers, and consumers. And so there is nothing that would prevent somebody from making a deal with an account in the same way, like you could do this, or you could not, or you'd be prevented from doing this in, in the United States. Uh, in some markets in the EU, you have got monopoly markets. For those of you who know the US, it's comparable to a control state, where uh, you know, the government is still in the market. So you look at some of the Nordic states as examples for that. 
we talked about the size of the market from a population perspective before. If you compare that to the US, it's basically 58% larger. For my spirits, consumption is only 15% larger. So the per capita consumption in the European Union is smaller, but overall the market is bigger. Uh, if you compare different states in the US, uh, larger states like California, Florida, and New York, uh, with the largest countries in the European Union, you look at a market like Germany, France, or the UK, uh, that are basically all bigger than the biggest states in the United States. From a compliance perspective, uh, we get a lot of the questions with regards to, can you bring in the same bottles? And the prevalent uh, choice for bottles in the uh, US is a 750 ml bottle, which is not permitted in the EU. So you look here at bottles that are common, that are uh, used in both territories, is the one liter bottle um, or the 1.75 liter bottle. But uh, questions of like a 500 ml that is uh, very attractive in the EU, that one is not permitted in the US, and the 750, as I said, it's not permitted in, uh, in the EU. Uh, from a perspective of, you know, the question we get a lot is this underfilling question. So if you have a 750 ml bottle, why can't you just put a little bit less in the bottle and therefore you keep the bottle the same? Uh, there is a directive that basically says of like how much underfilling you can do and therefore that is really not an option you should uh, pursue. From a label perspective, uh, in the United States there's a common label approval process and once you have it, you basically have the security that you can use it. In the EU, it's a little different. So you can have a label that works in one country, but it could not work in another country. So for example, you see this little pregnant woman symbol there at the label. So that one, if you want to sell in France, it's mandatory. But in other states, it's not. But on the opposite side, you can actually go in and you can develop a label that works pan-European. If you put in these elements in there and you put certain warnings in multiple languages, then it's the pan-European label. So in order to make it easier to sell in a bunch of countries at once, and from a logistics perspective, generally, uh, you can create that label. Um, from a category consideration perspective, uh, the EU actually uh, also defines some categories, and it's, in some instances it's different. I'm going to highlight just a few of them. For example, if you look at the non-flavored vodka, the minimum alcohol strength is 37.5 ABV, uh, while in the US it's 40% ABV. Uh, for rum, uh, it's very similar, uh, and on the gin side as well. Uh, the taxation, coming one more time back, so on the EU side itself, there's basically like no EU tax, while on the countryside, the country excise taxes, they are very widely and they can be very high. So you look at the ranges here on the right side, between 21 euros and 195 euros, that's a wide range of, uh, of country excise taxes. And then the VAT that comes in, that is within Europe, it's included in the price. If you look in the United States, that price is always uh, stated without the VAT in it. In, the, in Europe, it's part of the price. Uh, and that can vary also widely by, uh, by country. So here basically the excise tax by country, so you look at a country like Sweden at 195 uh, euros per nine liter case of 40% ABV, uh, and at the bottom there, Croatia, Bulgaria, or Romania at less than 30 euros um, per nine liter case. So that's it basically from a perspective of uh, the compliance background. I'm gonna hand it over now to Ronan to talk about uh, the route to market strategy. And um, we're gonna go through all the different panelists and then afterwards we're gonna open it up for questions. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Ronan Gillespie. I'm an independent business development consultant specializing in creating a route to market here in the EU and uh, establishing distribution networks. Um, I've been in the drinks industry for nearly 30 years. I started uh, my career with Jemison Irish Whiskey. When I joined Jemison in the early 1990s, Jemison sold less than half a million cases worldwide. It's now a seven million case brand. Um, we set ourselves the objective back then of being the best-selling whiskey in the world, which seemed kind of an unattainable goal uh, back in the 90s, but now that's very much within Pernod Ricard's um, kind of sight at the moment. 
Um, I spent 16 years selling Jemison around the world, and then in 2007 I set up my own uh, business development consultancy, Next Step International. One of my clients, Kerry Gold, asked me to join them full time in 2014 to establish a business unit uh, for Kerry Gold Irish Cream Liqueur, which uh, I launched for them here in Germany and in the US. Stayed with them for two years and then went back to doing what I like best, which is working for myself. Um, you'll see some of my current clients there, OZ Tyler Kentucky Bourbon Whiskey, that's great tasting Kentucky Bourbon Whiskey, which mixes traditional ways of making whiskey with, with innovation. I represent Luxardo, uh, Italian liqueurs in Ireland, uh, and I do some work for the Temple Bar Irish Whiskey and for a, an Israeli craft beer called Chevette. And you'll see on the other side some of my uh, past clients. I've many, many past clients, but I've done some work for Malfi Gin, for Nika Whiskey, for the Irishman Irish Whiskey, and for Oops uh, Wine from Chile. Um, setting a brew to market is a means to an end, and that end is brand building. That's ultimately what you want to do. So here are some of kind of just as a, a brief aside, some of my observations over the years in terms of key success factors for brand building. Now I'm not talking about the brand name here or packaging or all those good things, but for me, five key success factors are that it needs to taste great. And that probably goes without saying, but you would be surprised that people do come to market with, with products that don't taste great. Remember, through our marketing efforts, we can convince someone to buy one bottle of whatever it is we're selling but it's only if it tastes great will the consumer come back and buy a second bottle. So it needs to taste great. Secondly, you need to be able to explain to consumers why it tastes great. You need to have an easy, uh, easy to articulate unique selling point. Um, not just that you can talk to consumers about it, but that they can talk to their, their family, their friends, and their followers about it, that they can pass on that message. Third issue is a compelling brand story, the heritage piece. Why does this brand exist? Uh, fourthly, some, some investment. Consumers in this business, in the spirits business, they get very emotionally engaged with their brand. So if you're asking them to add new brands to their repertoire, you are gonna have to invest in that. You can't launch a cash cow. And lastly, patience. I referred to Jameson earlier. Jameson is like, it's an overnight success story that took 20 years. So there's no quick wins in, in this business. In terms of what we're here today to talk about, uh, creation of route to market, for me it's a three-stage process. And the first stage is the strategy. It's identifying the most attractive markets uh, for your brand. The second stage is the hard work, the importer search and selection piece. And then the third stage is working with that importer or distributor. And I'm going to use the words importer and distributor as you know, the same thing, because as, as Harry said, in the EU, it's not a three-tier system. You can find a distributor in a country. They can distribute. They can sell to off-premise, on-premise, etc. And often they'll call themselves an importer, even though technically under EU law they're a distributor. So you want to develop and grow that business over time. Don't just look at the biggest market for your brand uh, in Europe, because the big market might be in decline. There might be smaller markets which are in growth. Um, you know, these kind of criteria that I'm putting up here, um, you should take them all into account. I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but do take them all into account and, and maybe put a weighting beside them. The whole objective here is really to, to, to look at the markets and your importer search and selection as objectively as possible, and then maybe overlay some subjectivity over it. <coughs> so take into account the market growth rates. There could be some barriers to entry. Harry mentioned a few moments ago the, uh, the labeling that you might have for a specific country. That might be something that makes it awkward for you to go into that market. But if you take all of these issues into account, all of these criteria into account, you should then focus on one or two markets, in my opinion. There are 50 countries in Europe, 28 of which are in the European Union. Don't try and do them all at one time. If you'll spread yourself too thinly, try and focus on one or two markets. So after this kind of exercise, you'll be left with, you know, one or two lead markets. And for today, I'm just going to say, suppose that's Germany where we are today. And um, then you need to put together a long list of potential distributors. Now, here's a smattering of distributors, a handful. There are dozens more in Germany. From that long list, you want to get it down to a short list. 
of the companies that you want to approach, okay? And some of the things that you have to ask yourself in advance of making those approaches are, what kind of, what kind of business model are you, do you want to pursue? Now, if you're a big brand and you've got deep pockets, you can try and do everything in-house. You can do all the front office stuff like sales, marketing, business development, and the back office stuff like compliance, invoicing, warehousing, logistics. You can do that all yourself and interface with a distributor. You might go and look for a distributor that operates in more than one EU country. There are distributors who will tell you that they operate all over Europe, but usually there might be clusters. So you might have Germany, Austria, Switzerland together. You could have the Nordics and the Baltics together. Or you might find a distributor that works in France, Italy, uh, Spain and Portugal, for example. Now there's pluses to that. It means you only have one contact, point of contact, one invoicing entity, one you know, shipment destination. But the more services a distributor provides for you, the more margin they're going to want to take, and that's going to squeeze your margin. So you have to weigh up the pros and cons, etc. Or another option would be to play to your strengths. Listen, um, nobody is as passionate about your brand as you are, and nobody knows as much about your brand as you do. But you can't be good at everything. So maybe what you want to do is manage the front office yourself, the sales, marketing, distribution, directly with distributors, and outsource all the back office uh, stuff to a business like, like our hosts here today, Park Street, who will do compliance, logistics, warehousing, invoicing, etc. And that could be a, a really good way to do it. As I say, some of the criteria you need to take into account and you will have to ask each and every distributor um, their margin requirements, what they feel the retailer or the on-premise margin requirements will be. And that will, you know, depending on the services that you get from the distributor, your margin will therefore be, be squeezed if you want to remain competitive in the marketplace. Most distributors will tell you that they're great at execution and planning. Let them demonstrate that to you. Make sure that they show you what they've done on other brands. Cultural fit, are you going to get on with these people? I suppose what I've tried to do here is make everything as objective as possible, but there has to be some subjectivity. Do you get on with them today when you're talking to them? But what do you think it might look like in three years' time? What's it going to look like when there's a problem? Because there will always be problems, delayed shipments or you know, orders not complete, etc., etc. So how are you going to get on with them then? And then the last thing to take into account, I suppose, is that um, getting the first order from a new distributor in the EU, that's a, a moment of celebration, and it's something that you should be really proud of uh, when you get your first order. But it's far more important to get the second order and the third order and the fourth order, because that's repeat business, and that's ultimately what's your, your, your medium and long-term future. So here's a list of things that, again, the criteria you should take into account uh, in terms of ongoing business development with your distribution partner. Uh, the top one there is share of mind. If you're 2% of a distributor's turnover, you need to be about 5% of their activity, okay? You need them working harder for your brand than they are for other brands in their portfolio. And, and, you know, how are you going to do that? Well, you can incentivize them through extra margin, something like that. You need to build a long-term relationship with them and build it quickly. Um, clear communication is important. Let them know what your expectations are, but also ask them what their expectations of you are. And you'll see some other criteria there. Let them know what's happening in, in other markets, best practice sharing, etc. You might have enough budget to do some consumer insight, but make sure that when you come to the market, wherever it is in Europe, that you talk to bartenders and feed all of that kind of stuff back into, uh, back into your distributor, because you might get some insight from bartenders that, that they won't get. So in summary, as I say, for me, uh, route to market uh, strategy is a three-stage process. You need to do your homework. That's the strategic planning in terms of choosing one or two very attractive markets for you. Not necessarily the biggest, but the most attractive to you. Um, you have your importer search and selection piece. And then once you've chosen that partner and you have the right partner, then you need to build the business over time through that partner. OK? Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Rona. All right, Mark.
Well, good afternoon. My name is Mark de Witte, CEO of the Kuiper Royal Distillers. Um, give you a short uh, update on what company I represent and also um, what, in our point of view, the best route to market or a good route to market. And I um, want to make that, uh, that um, comparison also since we as a company ourselves went a couple of years to the US and then you start a total new market and then you need right partners. And we found it for, for the back office, especially with, uh, with Park Street. And, and that's an important one to, uh, to acknowledge because there are a lot of restrictions, a lot of things to know before you're entering a market. And they're better to have an experienced partner in the market. As a company, I give you a very short overview so that you know who I am and what we are doing. Um, the Kuiper Royal Distillers is a 320-year-old family company, very old, one of the oldest, uh, but in a complete transformation. So actually, we are a startup. We consider ourselves as a startup company. We start a big business transformation focusing on cocktails. Vision is owned the cocktail. Focus, and that's also what Ronan was, was pointing to, for us, focus is really important. We are exporting to 100 countries, but we only focus on 10, actually. And focus is really important. So when one of you is, is um, um, keen to, to come to Europe, then focus on one or two countries, like Ronan was saying. Pick out the real important one. And route to market is key. To have the right partner is absolutely key. Because you can have great brand, great assets when your partner lets you down, and especially when it gets a bit tough then you're absolutely lost, so uh, completely aligned with that one. We're focusing on 11 countries, as mentioned. Uh, we put in a complete change pro program, and we have started also to change our programs and our, our brands especially, because at the end, it's all about brand building. How do you build your brand? That's the only thing that counts. So we've uh, revamped the De Kuiper brand, uh, completely rechanged also the positioning, not only packaging, but also route to market, and changed also uh, the, uh, um, um, the focus on bartenders and separately on consumers. We're just in the middle of uh, revamping uh, Peachtree. It's just launching the market in a total new packaging positioning. Did the same with Rutte and Mandarin Napoleon, Bebo, a new launch, Cherry Herring, those are the brands, and Italicus, a couple of beautiful brands in half hitch. Coming to the Netherlands, uh, because it's all about, that's what, you, now you know who I'm representing, what we are doing, etc. But more important is, why do we think that the Netherlands is a relevant uh, route to market and a relevant entry country? Netherlands more, is not the biggest market, and that was also uh, pointed out by, uh, by Ronan. Uh, it's no, not in our point of view about having the biggest market because the biggest market most often is also very expensive to play. It's not only whether it's not it's growing, but also it's much more expensive. So a smaller market which you can control um, is most often easier to start with, and most often also everyone makes mistakes. In entering new markets, you make mistakes. So better to make it in a smaller market than make it in a bigger market because you have a different scale. So the Netherlands is a small country, 17 million people, 7 million households. Um, and we do think it's a good springboard to the rest of Europe. Um, since we are lucky enough to, to be a member of the European Union, we stay in, not like the Brits potentially going out, which is actually a shame. Uh, Rotterdam, main port, it's, it's the biggest harbour in, in Europe, so it's the main port, so also from a commercial, logistic point of view, it's really an easy country. Uh, and clearly central located in Western Europe. The alcohol consumption is more or less on, it's, uh, it's clearly only allowed above 18 years old. Um, then we have a very specific model in the Netherlands, and alcohol up till 15% is allowed to be sold in supermarkets, but everything above 15% is only allowed to be sold in special licensed stores. And that's an extra advantage, actually, because that's a channel which you can control much better than the bigger supermarkets. And it's easier to play and, and at lower cost to play. It's not a dark market, so advertising, everything is, is possible, everything is allowed. Clearly there are regulations, uh, but acceptable regulation, I would say, in the, in the average. Important to come to, as we said, as I said before, um, route to market is really key, the cost of entry, um, complexity of the market, uh, whether or not there are unique channels, and 
In the Netherlands, there are three unique, not unique, but there are three channels. The one is clearly the entree channel. Second one is this special licensed liquor stores. And the third one for alcohol below 15% is the supermarket. So you can play in three channels depending on your brand. It's, we do think very manageable because it's a small country. And within that, speaking about focus, actually two cities are really predominant. It's Amsterdam and Rotterdam. So especially when launching a spirit brand, a premium brand, it's pretty, you can focus on two cities actually. That's even more focused and, and better to handle. Um, in general, the investment costs are relatively low, so the media costs per capita are relatively low versus other countries. Um, and as mentioned, the regulations are there, but they are reasonable. In terms of excise, the Netherlands is more or less in the middle, that's also an important one, but also in terms of consumption, so the Netherlands is not the highest consumption, it's a bit lower than, uh, than especially um, Finland, uh, Germany, Great Britain, but it's at a very acceptable level and growing. And the cocktail culture is growing. That's also for us clearly an important one. The route to market is actually 75% of all spirits goes to off-trade, so it's an off-trade market. Um, as for example, Spain, which is 90% an on-trade market. So that's a different route to market, a different way of playing. So depending on your brand, whether or not you want to play more in off-trade or in on-trade, you can select your market. When you want to play more in the off-trade, then the Netherlands is a very good market. Off-trade, actually two channels, as mentioned, up till 15% ABV, about 4,000 outlets, that's the supermarkets. And then in the special liquor channel at the left-hand side, about 2,600 liquor stores, the specialized liquor stores, and they are licensed. And there, within that, actually there are a couple of, there, there are a lot of independents, but also two or three groups would actually make the, the, the country. So it's a couple of addresses where you have to play, and when you play there, then you more or less can control the route to market. In the on-trade clean, it's much more fragmented. There are about 46,000 on-trade outlets, but clearly also there is depending on your brand and what type of level you want to play. Is it an A outlet or a D outlet? Is it entertaining? Is it drinking, sleeping? Clearly depending on, on your brand. But the route to market is there. Like was said, it's, it's a pretty easy one. It's from the importer to wholesaler directly to, um, to the outlet. Another split, which I want to share with you, the total market is growing, by the way, with 3.2%. Um, and imported, as we call it, imported spirits about 70%, and domestic about 30%. And guess what? Like other countries, the domestic part is clearly declining. So the growth really comes from the imported spirits. In terms of split on trade, off trade, and especially at the right hand side, you see it for imported spirits. It's about 28% in the on-trade and 72% in the off-trade. So there's a little bit over um, um, uh, positioned for imported spirits. The categories growing are rum, vodka, gin. Clearly, that's a pretty, pretty uh, uh, um, yeah, logic in, in terms of the total global trends. And the Kia. The Kia is really also growing like hell at the moment. In the Netherlands, just as an example, we represent two companies. We set up a second company. We had already the Kuiper uh, for the, the main portfolio, and we set up a separate company called Cooper and Barrel, especially for the top spirits. Uh, the bartenders love spirits, so the smaller brands which really need to be nurtured, uh, which are the challenger brands, which advocacy focused, etc. That's Cooper and Barrel, and there also a brand like uh, Billy is representing uh, Fortaleza is, is captured there to, to really have the advocacy and the extra attention. This is a total portfolio coverage. It's a, it's a lot of brands, clearly, for the, the total company. Uh, but Cooper & Bell want to give you some examples. Uh, brand which was coming to, uh, to Europe, Michtes uh, joined us, Fortaleza joined us. Uh, so a couple of real, what I would say, real beautiful bartenders loved brands joined Cooper & Bell to have that route to market. So controllable and in, in yeah, I would say, in. Uh, in good company with chartreuse, hearing, etc. Last but not least, a couple of last slides. Um, so, important is not only focus, but also route to market. 
and we always work with a model in what type of outlet do we want to play in. Is there a top A outlet? In the Netherlands, only 50, which are the, the outlets where celebrities hang out, where you have a waiting list, the real top outlets. And it goes clearly to the more party cafes, etc. And depending on the type of outlet and depending on the type of brand, you have to choose clearly, but that's pretty logic. I'm preaching now for the, the guys who should know where you want to play, because you don't want to play in all four segments, you want to play in specific segments. So the, the better you know, the better you also can select your partner in the country. That's it. So, very short introduction. It's a an, um, recommendation on playing in the Netherlands. It can be with us, it can be with others, but it's an interesting country, just, just the recommendation I want to give you. Here Great. You go. Thanks so much, Mark. Oh, yes, Billy. Hi, I'm Billy Erickson. I work for Tequila Fortaleza. I do our uh, global sales management. And I'm here to tell you guys a little bit about just our experience in the EU. We've done two different kind of route to market. So I'll talk about what we were doing in the past and what we're doing, what we're doing now. But right now, this is uh, my role. So we're in about 22 countries and 35 states in the United States. So it's, it's a very wide role. But a little bit about Fortaleza, we started about 2006 in the United States. Our family history goes back to the 1870s though when my great, great, great grandfather founded a distillery or founded a tequila company called Tequila Sousa. The company was with our family for a number of years up until 1976 when my great grandfather sold the company. And my dad restarted Fortaleza out of this little tiny distillery that you see here, which is featured on our Blanco. We have four main lines, so it's not very a very complicated product line, um, and that lends to some simplicity. But I'll talk about our initial EU market entry. We did, at this point, I would say, not only do you have to think about the goals and focusing on which countries you would like to say like to enter, but you also think it, need to think about your own company's internal organization and your own internal capabilities. What are we good at? You know, Ronan said nobody's going to sell your product better than you are, and that's totally true, right? There's another thing too. Are you good at logistics? Are you good at doing this back end office stuff? Or that's a consideration, I should say. And then two is how much time management do you have? When you're taking on a whole new market like the EU, is it a whole, is it something you can put on somebody's plate where you can do this internally or do you need to outsource it? And for us, initially, we outsourced a lot of this. We were outsourcing our sales and we had one broker for all the EU who contacted distributors, uh, you know, and to jump back to what my colleagues were saying here earlier, it's all about that margin. So our, our pricing was about 15% higher than it was today because they were a full, you know, took the product, sold to distributors, did the marketing for us, did the brand work for us in market, right? And that's one option you can use. So that was um, some pros there, of course, were, were that you had this one point of contact. You were, you've essentially outsourced one whole continent or one sales market to one area. But some of the cons of that are that when you do travel and you do want to do brand activations yourself in these markets is that there's a, a friction between you, the distributor, and getting that contact, that route of information is uh, more hampered by that other point of contact. So it can be good. It can be, you know, has some upsides and has some downsides. And this, we did this for about three years until Park Street opened over here. We worked with Park Street in the United States as well having somebody to access the logistical support through warehousing in Rotterdam. That took a lot more off our plate. It was better integrated for us, at least, with our sales in the United States. So when this option became available, I should say we jumped to this. And then when we did do that, we took a much more active role in partnering with our distributors, which has some upsides. We've got exercising more control over the brand, right? Specifically selecting activations that we want to do in the market. The only problem is it's a lot more time. So my total European meeting time went from about 
two or three, four hours a quarter to now we're looking at a 20-hour investment to a quarter. It's a, uh, essentially almost a, another third of my job. Um, and we've added a, a sales ambassador who specifically comes to the EU. And so not only is it picking what's right for you, picking goals, evaluating your time, it's also every few years your capabilities as an organization are going to change and you need to adapt your route to market to those new capabilities that you have internally and rethink what you're trying to accomplish strategic wise. Thank you so much, Billy. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, all, all of our panelists. And uh, I open it up now uh, for any questions you guys might have. How significant is e-commerce as a channel in Europe and, and for a brand getting started in Europe is that a good channel to consider early, or is it better to leave that you know, for later? I think it depends a little bit on the price point of the brand. The more expensive the brand, the more attractive I think e-commerce can be. I think if you have a very low-cost brand, it's probably the economics are difficult. Um, when you compare it to the United States, it's much easier e-commerce here. And I don't know if there's a lot of downside of exploring it. I think that's a little bit of the consideration, but I would love to hear if you guys have a perspective on it. Now, when I can uh, end speaking for, for the Netherlands, um, I, I would say that there are two angles to it. The one side is clearly uh, when you're a new brand, uh, the retailers, the, the standard retailers, are less happy with you when you go immediately to, uh, to e-commerce. That's, that's the one you need to consider. That said, the majority of the retailers have already starting or are starting e-commerce, and clearly the big ones like Amazon, etc. Um, you have to be in, in in a certain moment because um, a they're they're growing, so you you can't ignore them in the long run. But the timing is is important clearly, and and the second one is that um, already in the Netherlands about 10 to 12 percent is via e-commerce going already to the off-trade sectors. So it's, it's a serious channel. And yeah, I think that's uh, absolutely right. It is, it is growing fast. I think what, where e-commerce can play a great uh, role is linking to on-premise tasting promotions. So you, know, you do have occasions, not as often as we'd like, but you do have occasions where you can go into the on-premise, taste someone on your brand, which is a brand new brand. But you know, if they like it, they can then go onto their phone, order a bottle, and have it delivered to their home the following day. And if you can link your on-premise tasting to an incentive online, whoever it might be, um, you know, that's a win-win situation. And I'll give a perspective. I just think that going back to your goal, the goal for us here over here was to be in uh, some of the top bars and, you know, the mixology cocktail bars. So for us, e-commerce wasn't a goal. We're available through it, and I think people will buy us through it. But when you're talking a 50-euro bottle investment, it's, it's more of a hand sell than something you're going to be like, well, I'm going to take a chance on this and, and order it off Amazon and see where it goes. How do, you, how do you or working with your distributors work with large retailers like Tesco or Carrefour or any of those in terms of placements and distribution? So what's sort of the general process and relationship you have with them? Obviously, in the U.S., you work more through... Right, your distributors, you have some relationship, but because of that, right, the three-tier system, there's a level of removal. How do you manage those relationships here in Europe? Oh, that's an easy one. You always, um, clearly, although some of those companies, uh, or those retailers have in, in multiple countries um, uh, branches, but it's always, an, an, in principle, a local uh, situation. So when you want to, to work with Carrefour in, in Belgium, for example, you need a an, an Belgian partner. To, uh, to deliver to them, to, to have an agreement with them, and the same counts for uh, when you go to France or whatever. So you always need a local partner to, to do the business with them. Uh, the only exception might be a company like Lidl, which is pan-European, but sometimes you can have a direct access, but most often you need to go via distributor or importer. And it's very depending per country. In, uh, for example, in Germany, there's a lot of uh, listing fees, uh, but Great Britain, there's no listing fees at all, in, in general. It's, it's very depending on the country, so there's really local rules. Uh, but all in all, I've, I've had the privilege to, to work in 11 countries in Europe. All in all, at the end, it's more or less 
equalizing out. Uh, so sometimes you pay more on listing fees, sometimes you pay less, but different things. But all in all, the, the cost of doing business is more or less the same. I would echo what Mark said. I think that's very pushed at the, the distributor level. They bring those opportunities up, and then we execute on them only really in partnership with them. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, the distributors will hold that relationship with Tesco or Carrefour very close to their, their own chest. They won't want uh, brand owners you know, being part of that relationship. And they'll couch it in saying, well, we're selling in a whole portfolio, so we can't bring every brand owner to every Tesco meeting. And there is some truth in that. Um, and what they might do is they might leverage their existing portfolio to get a new brand into um, distribution on a, you know, a regional basis or a store for size format basis. So it's in your interest, obviously, if, if you've got a retail brand, um, but it's hard as a brand owner to get direct contact with the, with the, uh, the big buying chains. And that's, I think, for sure on the, on the non-e-commerce side, because I think on the e-commerce side, mm -hmm. they try to, I think, go direct with, I mean, they would like to have brands have a direct relationship with them. So if you look at an Amazon or Master of Mod, they would prefer to have less players in between if they could. Uh, what are some of those pitfalls that you've seen brands entering the EU and their route to market and vice versa, some of the successes? Uh, that some, a brand's done really well. I think the, the, the biggest pitfall is kind of what I alluded to, or we, I think we all alluded to, to, which is spreading yourself too thinly, trying to do too much. Um, like in, in the States, a brand that tries to go into all 50 states at one time, you know, isn't going to be very successful. So you need to build a beachhead. You need to, you know, take baby steps, then, you know, start to walk and then start to run. And when your brand becomes established in one country, and there are, you know, there's trend leading cities, we're in one right now in Berlin. So get your brand, brand established in Berlin, and that'll trickle to other cities in Germany, but also to places outside Germany. Um, in terms of, of successes, I mean, listen, you know, America is still very uh, aspirational here in Europe, American brands, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, etc., but but also in in, in spirits, American whiskies, uh, you know. So, Americana is still a big thing in Europe and still very aspirational. So, you know, a success story put plenty of stars and stripes on it, and uh, chances are it'll 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 sell. I've got one question: uh, the topic of grey market uh, goods. Do you have a perspective with regards to? you know, how damaging or how advantageous they could be and how best to manage. It is one, uh, the grey market exists, and the grey market exists because companies have different pricing in different markets, and companies have managers which want to make bonuses to, to sell off at lower prices. Um, so there's nothing wrong with the grey market, you can't blame those guys, it, it's there. Uh, the only thing to, to, uh, to, to make sure that you don't get in there is making sure that you have a harmonized pricing. And that's clearly depending on excise per country, clearly sometimes there's some currency effects, etc. But within, especially within the Europe, there should not be too much uh, difficulty on that one. And you know the excise, sometimes it can change, but then you have to adapt. Um, unless, and some companies flourish with, with, uh, with grey uh, gray market activities, but when it happens to you, then most often as brand owner, it's your own either deliberate choice or mistake. That, that's my very clear yeah. perspective on it. Rona? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's a fact of life. Uh, you know, we've had a single market here since 1992. Um, I know when I was with, with Jemison, um, Tesco wanted to buy all of the Jemison uh, for Europe through the Czech Republic because they saw a, a purchasing advantage. So they wanted us to ship uh, Jemison from Ireland to the Czech Republic so they could ship it back to Ireland. And they were still going to make money on that. So. You know, as Mark said, it's about price harmonization and, you know, a company like Pernod Ricard, we, we started implementing price harmonization in 1992, but remember the Czech Republic didn't join the EU until 2004, so there was still, you know, pockets where Tesco saw, saw an opportunity there. Um, you know, in terms of pitfalls to, to your question, uh, if you don't harmonize your prices and you build that beachhead in one market and then you're selling cheaper in another market, you are going to cause yourself uh, problems. 
but it's up to you as the brand owner with your dis distribution network to, to manage that. And there's no point in investing in one market, um, having a high price in that market, selling cheaper in another market, and then all the goods will come in. It, it's perfectly legal in the EU and has been since 92 when the single market was, uh, was established. So it's a fact of life. We need to manage it. But, but you're clear, you have to have a vision on it. Uh, when, when you just go to a distribution partner, you let the distribution partner set your price. And price is clearly key in the total market positioning of your brand. So you have to advise what price level you want to go. And you have to, to check the total value chain in what margin is made where in the chain, and what, what margin at the end as a brand owner you keep. And when you do that way, then you can go to the next country and you still have the same harmonized price because you know what the consumer price should be and you know whether or not there is risk for, for grey market, but it's really up to... And I've seen, I've seen big brands, it's a couple of big brands which are now even sold for mil, mil, billions, which started in Europe with prices all over the, the place. And, um, and they have now a lot of trouble to, to get it right. So when you start, better have it right from the beginning, but, but set your own price, make sure that you do that. Billy? Yeah, I think it is a major pitfall in the United States, you know, it's something brands from the United States don't ever think about because cross-selling in the United States is totally forbidden. Um, so that, that would be one of the major pitfalls, I would say, of brands walking over here, not setting up correct pricing, sorry, um, and then falling into this gray market area where they then have to raise the price significantly in some of their markets to make sure that it's harmonized across the EU. Yeah, because one last thing, and that's, that's also an important one, you're not allowed clearly to stop sending brands from one country to another. That's absolutely illegal. You're not allowed to, to say to, um, so suppose you're selling at a low price in Germany, and then in Italy, for example, the price is much higher, so there's a lot of great market activities going to Italy. You're not allowed to stop that. The only thing you can do is raising your price. That's the only thing, but you're not allowed because that's illegal and it gives you a penalty of 10% of your global turnover, 10% of your global turnover. So that's, that's really a penalty. So, so it's not about market fixing. You need to set the right price. And the only thing you can do is controlling your own price. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you, everybody.